This is a lecture on skyscrapers and steel. My name is Joseph T. Wonderlich. I am a professor of engineering, architecture, and computer science. This lecture contains uh, architecture theory and urban design throughout and engineering innovations. Here are the primary sources. Uh, you can come back and take a look at these uh, later or search them. Uh, also, uh, we will refer to my education in architectural engineering and urban design and uh, experience in building, in building industry, both architecture and engineering. A skyscraper is a tower uh, do, during feudal times. Uh, Europe and Japan is used to uh, protect cities. It's a picture of me in Belgium, 2014. Castle. Castile beer cell. I was one of the number of castles that uh, my son and I visited, we're planning to visit, actually this, uh, I believe we only went to this one castle, we had many other things we were doing on this tour. Uh, now in architecture theory, uh, defining space, we want to talk about uh, a tower, it's, uh, or an obelisk established, as establishing a point on, on the ground, it makes itself visible in space, and it generates a field about itself. At the center of its environment, a point is stable and at rest, organizing surrounding elements. Its field. Rome, 2011. Traveled by myself. I visited the Pantheon Institute, helped establish a relationship with them, and the architecture. Also presenting at a conference uh, that when uh, the uh, tower is moved off center, uh, it can be thought to be more aggressive and uh, begins to compete for supremacy. Visual tension is created between the points in its field. This is from the architecture theory text, referenced in the beginning. Uh, and Venice is one of my favorite places to visit. Been there four times. Piazza San Marco. Tower. Next to the Basilica. If you go to Venice, I highly recommend flying into Venice Airport. Maybe staying right around the airport. So there's a couple of different very nice bed and breakfasts, and then taking the boat. Uh, you, know, you can come in by train. I've done that before. And of course, there's no cars in Venice. Um, a vertical line in architecture theory can express a state of equilibrium with gravity and symbolize the human condition. This trip was one of the two times my son was with me. See the picture on the left. Uh, prior to the 1800s, most buildings were not very tall and mostly made of wood or unreinforced masonry or concrete. Uh, the Romans used it extensively. This is the uh, Pantheon in Rome. And uh, the concrete is a concretion, a mix of aggregate, essentially rocks, and sand, but rocks of different sizes, and a uh, uh, cementaceous binding material, cement, typically Portland cement, uh, named after a Portland stone in Britain several hundred years ago, because it looked like it. It's not from Portland. Uh, in the early 1800s, the United States, uh, first cast iron frames. 
uh, and building fronts, uh, often painted to look like stone or other materials. Uh, then after 1865 and the Civil War, the United States uh, Industrial Revolution, which is actually the second Industrial Revolution, officially what we refer to as Industrial Revolution, mass production, uh, tall buildings uh, resulted. Uh, and, uh, and, and because of a rise of urban real estate values, a uh, desire of business to remain in the center of activity, that led to many downtown buildings. A little history here. This is from uh, our, our, our architectural history book. And uh, as you can see on the references, um, <clears throat> the home insurance building, uh, the first steel skeleton, also um, much cast iron. The first floor had masonry load bearing walls, still using masonry. Also one of the first skyscrapers to use elevators. This also allowed high rises to exist, otherwise people are walking up quite a few stairs. So uh, in low and medium range uh, high rises, uh, you can't go too many floors with hydraulic, but uh, you can go up a number of floors. But if you want to go very high, you need the electrical elevators. And braking systems and buffers allowed them to be safe. Then the uh, uh, Rand McNally building is the first to use structural steel for the entire frame, 1889. I'll talk a little bit about the difference, uh, different types of, uh, of uh, steel, or talk about steel versus iron, uh, cast iron, and wrought iron. Uh, cast iron is an alloy of iron, carbon, and silicon that is cast in a mold. It's hard, it's a brittle though, a non-malleable, workable. Wrought iron is a form of iron that is tough, malleable, and re relatively soft, contains usually less than 0.1% carbon. Carbon is a critical element in steel and carries one or 2% of slag mechanically mixed with it. A steel is commercial iron that contains carbon as an essential alloy in constitution. And, uh, and is distinguished from cast iron by its malleability, less or more ductile. There's a lot of detail in this lecture. I won't go over all of it. You may want to come back and take a look at it or pause and take a look at it. Uh, this is comparing cast iron, wrought iron, and steel, the different properties. Wide flange, uh, it's not an I beam. Um, that's an historic reference. It's a wide flange in structural steel design. Uh, it's great for flexural strength, compression strength, shear strength, tensile strength. It's just strong all around. The process, uh, you can take a look at the diagram here in detail. Making steel, got a couple pictures. This is from one of our other references. See it's molten hot poured into a crucible and then um, shaped, rolled, rolling mills, cut, cooled. The different uh, ways you can look at the uh, wide flange sections. Also, a couple other types of sections, channels, angles, hollow sections, T. More detail of that. Those. Now, the structural engineering design manual, um, I have a lot of details here, and I want you to take the time and go and look into some of these. Um, this is a profession in itself. You don't want to do this, take this lightly, and you won't be allowed to in most places. Structural engineer, it's a full-time career. This is a structural design manual, or an excerpt from it in this one book here. Uh, here's the actual steel construction manual. Mine is 
1980 edition that I used for steel design. Of course, just in steel design. University of Texas in Austin in 1982 or three. Now the properties. Uh, to fully understand all the variables here, you'll need to go into these reference, come back and take time to do this. I wouldn't do this right now. This is going to take a little time. Uh, go back, now look at the steel design manual, uh, parts of it online. And then the design example, let's look through that. And then take a look at this quick video. Uh, once you have looked at some examples in the official manual, this is a nice quick little several minute uh, video. And so you can see uh, handwriting there, resolving the forces, free body diagram, of moments. Steel frame structures um, that can melt, so fire safety coatings developed uh, after the Great Fire in Chicago. Uh, they can handle large lateral loads, wind and seismic. Wind is very important in Chicago, to sign for earthquakes in California, of course. And in two ways to handle the lateral lateral loads, braced frame, self-explanatory there, or moment connection. So where the beams and columns meet is a tough moment resisting connection. A moment you can think of as like a torque. Braced frames cheaper. Uh, moment connection allows you unobstructed views. Uh, this was something we considered and it was several dollars per square foot per square foot difference when in developing building high tech office parks in California, where you obviously need to compensate for the seismic loads, which are lateral loads. And so this was a concern because uh, when you're building a shell speculatively and you want to lease out space, the tenants want to be able to see out the windows unobstructed. Brace frame versus moment connection. Now the actual physical connecting methods, uh, rivet, hot, rivet, rivets inserted here. Bolts. Welds. Different kinds of welds. You can look into that on your own. Now bolted and welded here on the diagram on the right, and that's the form of moment connection. So I think this uh, these pictures can give you an idea of the difference between uh, a non-moment connection building, where presumably you'd have diagonal bracing if you needed to compensate for lateral loads and high winds or seismic. On the left here. It's just a shear connection. That means just uh, resisting the, the downward force load on the beam and how that's uh, the reaction forces on the uh, uh, column that it's connected to. So you have the shear connection there, the plate, that angle iron, bolting the beam to the column is under uh, shear stress. On the right, you have a moment connection. So. You do what's called moment distribution, where you uh, do a structural calculation of the entire frame of the building, where the, you imagine uh, you calculate all the torques as they distribute throughout the building. And these are rigid connections, so imagine that entire beam uh, torquing, and that connection is resisting the torque of it. Here's a, a shear core versus a braced tube. This is an overall structural shape. And so you have a, a central core carrying the load, the main load. This is, this is a common thing to do in high rises um, or a braced tube. 
Here is a typical framing plan uh, for the steel erectors. And you see the wide flange columns and then the the wide wide the wide flange beams and also the columns you can see spaced the intersections section a bar joist so a bar joist uh, you bring on the site already prefabricated and you put it in place here and you can see the way that goes together with uh, corrugated metal deck and some lightweight concrete. Uh, and you can see in the bottom left-hand corner how it is bearing. One way of doing it, you can, you can bear it in different ways on different types of uh, materials. It's best to put it on structural steel. If you put it on concrete or wood, you're going to need a bearing plate to distribute the load. Uh, and it's probably not the best idea. You want to be, you want to put steel onto steel typically. And this is how it would be fabricated in the shop. Now, the architect certainly would not be making these, uh, and the structural engineer certainly could. Uh, typically, the, the truss manufacturer will have a structural engineer on board, so you wouldn't use the consulting structural engineer hired by the architect on a particular building to do this. I mean, it could be done, but I don't believe it's typically done. I have not seen it that, done that way. This is a, a space truss. And uh, this is just another example out of this reference book here. Um, steel cables, cable structure. In this case with transparent acrylic plastic panels. Some details, uh, structural engineer would specify this. Uh, architect could in small, I wouldn't do some high rise, you need structural engineer on high rise. But if you had a one story building, perhaps uh, retail, strip center, like commercial, like industrial, uh, you could, but it's best to always have a structural engineer do these kind of calculations. So, <laughs> this is how a column would fasten to a concrete floor. Corrugated deck. In this picture on the left, you see three different kinds. One kind on the right. Steel versus fire. So this is something to consider. Steel will melt. Uh, it's got to get very hot, very, very hot, not just normal hot outside temperatures, but fire hot, and it will melt. There's ways of fireproofing it, and uh, I see some various methods here. And then a comparison of steel versus wood versus brick versus concrete. Steel is definitely the strongest thing you can use. Um, well, for, yes, it generally is. It's, um, there's different properties I'll let you take a look at here. Uh, this is something you want to get used to is uh, for specifying the engineers in an architectural office in a big firm that does high rises or commercial construction. Will be somebody just writing specifications. It very often be a, an engineer, uh, but the architect should be familiar with this too. In the master's format, uh, there's a standard AIA and CSI both have uh, standards, and uh, that's something you can have a whole course in. I had a whole course at the University of Texas in this, uh, just for specification writing. In commercial construction, uh, you don't use wood studs. And by commercial, I'm also speaking of retail and light industrial, uh, anything other than residential American wood stick frame construction. Uh, now, th there is uh, 
light steel construction mixed with wood in some cases, but I like to differentiate between commercial and residential and typically by steel versus wood. And that's not uh, an abnormal thing to do. Uh, that's the way my, my experience in Pennsylvania, Texas and California, that all the uh, architects, engineers, developers, everybody contractors would refer to commercial versus residential. And many of the building codes and ordinances, planning, zoning, will refer to it that way also. And of course, you can get more specific, but two main categories, commercial versus residential. So this is a whole different way of doing things. Um, when I first was managing large projects in Texas, I made the mistake of hiring a small firm. I uh, let them bid. Uh, they were a good residential home building crew that moved from Pennsylvania. And I thought, well, I got to give my people business from my old stomping ground. Um, they had to leave in the middle of the job, kind of ashamed, because uh, it's a whole different trade to do commercial construction. It's uh, just the layout of studs. And of course, you can learn it, but to do it fast and efficiently and not make mistakes, uh, you need to do this for a living. A picture of that. Now, back to a little bit of history. Um, Louis Sullivan was the father of skyscrapers. I don't think anybody would dispute that. In Chicago, 1800s, lady, it's early 1900s. Uh, so a couple of his buildings, he did have a partner, Adler and Sullivan. Um, this is the Wainwright building. This is the famous building. And Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, yeah, frankly, Wright had worked a little bit for uh, somebody else, uh, Joseph Silsby, but Frank uh, had Louis Sullivan as his main mentor. And so he always referred to him as his uh, Liebermeister, his master, dear master. Um, and then so frankly, Wright referred to this building as the very first human expression of a tall steel office building as architecture. Uh, it has a base, a uh, middle section atop, top, like a classical column. Another Louis Sullivan building, and the father of skyscrapers in St. Louis, in Buffalo, New York. So a little bit about Frank Lloyd Wright. This is not a whole lecture on Frank Lloyd Wright, but I have some places you can drill down if you would like. So at age 21, Frank Lloyd Wright approached uh, this famous, most famous of architects in Chicago. And uh, he's, he's quoted as saying, Frank Lloyd Wright's quoted as saying, I was accepted by Mr. Sullivan and went to work rather than Sullivan. Then the only moderns in architects, moderns, and with whom, for that reason, I wanted to work. So they both were somewhat uh, rebels of the time and the personalities clicked. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright quickly rose to be in charge of 49 other draftsmen. And uh, uh, he was given a five-year contract. He borrowed against it with personal loan from Louis Sullivan. There's a whole history there uh, or how and the repercussions of that. And then he married his wife, Catherine here. She was 17 when they met. Uh, here's something that I'd like you to just drill down into and take 10 minutes to watch the beginning of this, uh, where I visited uh, 31 sites with my son in uh, Chicago and the surrounding areas, where the, the majority of Frank Lloyd Wright's most famous designs are. Uh, he has over 500 designs, so uh, you certainly could find 31 others. But this is a high concentration, especially around Oak Park. That's what allowed us to uh, 
to see all these over a couple weeks time, four days right in one concentrated part. So view that video, first 10 minutes of it. Um, neither of these architects liked, liked, liked neoclassicism, so uh, Greek and Roman, pseudo-Greek and Roman styles. Uh, they were both annoyed by the white city built for the World's Fair in Chicago. So if you just watch that video, you see we were looking for the remnants of that. There's not a whole lot left. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright was quoted as, uh, quoted the French poet Victor Hugo saying, it was the setting sun all mistook for dawn. So that's an interesting thing. A lot of people were buying into the whole neoclassicism thing at the time, but not right, or really Sullivan. Uh, this is going to blast the buildings with exterior load-bearing uh, masonry. You can see what it's fanned out at the bottom. It did have a steel or an iron frame uh, side. Lateral bracing. Here's a precursor of the curtain wall we're going to talk about in a second and high rises. Um, this is out of terracotta. Over and this is a steel frame building. Uh, the curtain wall. So if you have a skeleton that's really strong, if you have a very strong uh, structure, like a spine, then you can make the skin not be structural, not be load bearing. It can be all glass, curtain wall. Well, this is a typical floor plan for modern commercial construction. You can see it's wide open, which is nice. So you can parse up into different offices. Typically, you build a shell, speculatively, developers do, uh, without tenants often. You know, sometimes it'll be a major high-tech company or something. That's what I was involved with, parts of the spaces, or maybe the entire space. I did that a couple buildings. Uh, but then you if you don't have tenants, then you have this uh, interior space, and, and it's called tenant improvements, uh, where you have space planners. They're not... Uh, always licensed architects. They don't need to be to design the interior spaces. They're, 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 they're more uh, architectural than uh, interior designers. They understand architectural things and are, are often trained as architects, but it's a different, uh, it's a different skill. Uh, this was one of my jobs working for uh, developers. And this is in Austin, Texas, a 13 building office park. You can see my office there, my drawings and my computer. It's a story there that uh, an estimating business put myself through school and that's what helped me get a job with the developers. Came in as actually assistant project manager, the, developer, the project manager quit just a couple weeks later. So I was very young, saddled with quite a bit of responsibility. Personal secretary, and uh, I put into IBM 360 computer center. That's somewhat foreshadowing to my later career in high tech, which I'm presently known for more than buildings, actually, including IBM Research. This is Austin, Texas. Quite beautiful most of the year. Uh, January is kind of crappy, but and the summer is blistering hot for a couple months, but. In general, uh, great place, Austin, Texas. Then uh, time in California. So uh, Southern California, this was one of my projects, my, my main project for this particular developer. And uh, so I coordinated all that, negotiated all the contracts, supervised all architecture and engineering and actually added some architectural ideas quite a bit. Uh, so here's um, uh, more high rises in history. So this is uh, in Chicago, not real high. Now we're starting to go higher and higher. Here's the Flatiron Building in New York doesn't quite stand out like that anymore because there's high rises all around it. But you can imagine at the time, as you can see in this picture, that's quite a statement. Um, 
a little bit about reinforced concrete, even though this is uh, mainly about steel buildings. So you can you can go up in uh, reinforced concrete and uh, whole separate lecture on that. Uh, so I'll spend time in here. Slip forms allow you to go up quickly. Let's see this mentioned in other project, uh, other talks I give about the reinforcing steel. Um, my Pennsylvania project, which my son in the bottom left hand corner, helping put the reinforcing steel uh, supports. A little more history. Woolworth Building in New York, going up. This is the Art Deco style. Chrysler Building. The very first sticking up above this. the others in a very nice way. Uh, Empire State Building, that was the tallest building in the world for 40 years. Uh, watch a little movie clip there. I believe that one has uh, King Kong in the movie climbing up it. Uh, more details you can come and look at later in modern architecture in general, the Bauhaus movement and how that all started. Uh, and uh, people who came here from Europe, Germany, primarily uh, around, in, in around Chicago, often Le Corbusier in France uh, can be credited with this kind of thing, which is kind of cool. Um, it's mutated into, unfortunately, somewhat sterile, uh, housing projects in American inner cities and somewhat uh, nondescript high rises for housing in other countries. Dr. Bouzier ideas. And uh, Van der Rohe. Sears Tower. That was the tallest building for a long time after the Empire State Building. Philip Johnson is an interesting character because he's a modernist and also a postmodernist. As you can see here, postmodern uh, you know, echoes back to uh, some more traditional things. So you see the pediment at the top of the building, reminiscent of a grandfather clock. So, you know, a little more uh, traditional, if you will. Uh, here's some more postmodern, Philip Johnson, and then a picture I took in uh, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome in the Vatican, which I think is similar. Uh, so the uh, Sony Tower, Philip Johnson, reminded me of this Vatican Museum photo I took. Now to uh, Southeast Asia, uh, postmodern. So this is just, you know, reflecting some of the vernacular, some of the architectural vocabulary of a particular culture. So you look at this and if you've been to this part of the world, you may say, well, yes, that's in context of things I would see from long ago in this area. Same with uh, Taiwan, vernacular form for that area. Uh, this is a little odd. I call this the Lego man pants. Reminds me of a Lego man, just this lower half. Uh, this is a deconstructive style. Recent times in China. Here's Frank Gehry, here's the deconstructive style, Frank Gehry. New York, very recent. Ah, uh, you can look at this later on, different deconstructive styles. This is the world's tallest building now. Uh, very tall. See how it's sectioned off into areas, multi-use. Take a look at that little video, see lightning striking it. 
Uh, and then uh, interior structures and corresponding building heights. So you could see sections down below with different ways you can do buildings. Uh, imagine the space that you're creating with each of them. And of course, there's costs, the varying costs and methodologies for creating each. And even more. Go back and take a look at those if you like. A couple recent novel kinds of designs, neo-futuristic. A bunch of those. Uh, well, I want to talk a little more about this one. So this is a sustainable design. This is in uh, Shanghai, China. And it's more than just a building. Uh, first, just let's look at some form of it. Conceptual design, shapes, architecture. Do quite a bit of this, and they do. You don't want to rush the concept. Next thing you know, you're just building something if you didn't take your time thinking things in the abstract, and you're going to go down one path without considering the others. Curtain wall, which is not unusual, but it's a very tall curtain wall. Uh, and what is unusual is this outer curtain wall is creating a environment for people to uh, some of a natural environment or pseudo natural pseudo natural environment between the inner shell and the outer shell. Huge glass curtain wall hung hung from the upper deck. So it's certainly not load bearing. See double walls here, how the space lays out. Very unique. Uh, details you can come back and look at later and sustainability uh, and how that works with the facade and wind, heating, cooling, and rainwater collection. Color coded. It has a concrete core and, uh, and structure of steel. Uh, it's not the tallest building, but it's not trying to be. It's a vertical green city. Multi-use. Uh, this has nothing to do with the coronavirus. I put this in several years ago when I first made this lecture as a guest lecture and high rises um, world architecture course several times. And I was just talking more about the pollution. Uh, but Perhaps when people are looking at this, I'm recording this now right in the middle of the coronavirus, where we are making online lectures because of, uh, of the necessity for isolation, social distancing. A little more about Frank Lloyd Wright. He certainly was not a, a high-rise architect, but he did this one, uh, uh, 19 floors, and convinced the owner to do it by convincing him that it was more efficient, it was more scalable to take all the infrastructure up as a core, uh, which is true. Uh, much more detail you want to look at right now, but I have a whole lecture series on Frank Lloyd Wright and. Uh, as I gather information from many sources, I draw some conclusions on what inspired him to be the person that he was, the architect that he was. His personal life is maybe not something to be celebrated too much, considering some of the mistakes he made. Actually, tragedy in one case, not his fault, but uh, his architecture is obviously excellent. Uh, and then some of his thoughts here about uh, 
buildings and this applies to high rises too. Um, the bowels, circulation, and nerves were new in buildings, right? So you can scale things and distribute things in these large buildings. Uh, more detail than you want to look at right now, but uh, his organic architecture is something that I like to study myself and find uh, how much he's influenced, has been influenced by other th ancient things and the things of his time and well, how much he influenced others to come after him. Perceived or lived after he did. Um, <clears throat> He was a modern architect, but very different from the other modern architects. So he's grouped with the modern architect just because of the time frame that he practiced and lived. Uh, and then just a little statement about staying close to earth, not necessarily going high. We'll go quickly through these slides. You can take some time to look at them later. This is uh, Kyoto. No buildings allowed more than 60 meters high. This is my son and I in Kyoto in 2013. You see the effect of not going too high, only letting certain things come up above the others, spiritual things. Right? You limit the building heights, then the thing you do allow to go up really stand out, especially things like this. Uh, it symbolizes a gate to the spiritual world and Look at the size of that. That's a tractor trailer that you see parked at the bottom there. Love that. The building's more than 60 feet tall. There's whole stories to go behind every one of these slides. For another day. Every one of these. We talk 10, 15 minutes about every slide. Uh, and enough of Frank Lloyd Wright for now, but this is uh, just more of the horizontal here. Frank Lloyd Wright, field trip we had. Uh, you can imagine. I like Frank Lloyd Wright. Thanks. So back to skyscrapers. Um, scraping the sky can be part of quality urban design. The buildings complement each other and their surroundings, and a vertical culture is established. So in the early 80s, I'm in Austin, Texas. I always thought this tower should have a little dome on top of sorts, but no, it's distinct the way it is. And then I worked for developers there after college. I did have an estimating business also while in college. Uh, recent Austin skyline, much more. Uh, I haven't been there in many years, 30, 34 years since I've been there. That's what it looks like now. San Diego, I went to after Texas, and then I do go back there frequently. I worked for developers and then uh, went back to school and urban design, worked for San Diego County Planning Commission. And then had an itch to go north up to San Francisco, worked an engineering consulting firm there, and then began my whole high-tech career, first as a physics grad, and then master's and PhD. And stories, complete other stories for other times. So now, um, this is a very good video that I'd like you to take time to look at. So hopefully you can agree from having watched this video that uh, things up high can certainly be joy joyful. And just some personal pictures validating that thought.
if you're interested in further studies in architecture, we have our architectural studies minor and you can see how this lays out. If you're in engineering, it's actually very easy to do because we double count a couple of courses in there. And uh, we also count the core, two core courses in there. So uh, many of you could very easily have a minor in architectural studies.